Strategies Group. Please, David. Thank you. Well, it's a real pleasure to be here where I've had many uh, satisfying moments at the Bold Foundation develop, exploring and developing the commons through a number of conferences we had in 2010 and 2013 with my colleagues at the Common Strategies Group. So thank you, Silke, for that introduction, and thank you for the Heinrich Bold Foundation for hosting this event. I mean, I'm, I'm really kind of amazed that we're still celebrating something that's 800 years old. It, that's, you know, how many things are that old that we still remember and celebrate? But we often don't know the real history of this, which the, the anniversary is essentially about the signing of a peace treaty uh, on the fields of Runnymede, England in 1215, which settled a very bloody battle, uh, civil war, between the much despised King John and his rebellious barons and commoners of eight centuries ago. And what was intended as a, an armistice, a, a peace treaty, was soon regarded as a canonical statement about the proper structure of governance. And amidst a lot of archaic language about medieval ways of life, Magna Carta is now seen as this landmark statement about the limited powers of the sovereign and the rights and liberties of ordinary people. The king's acceptance of the Magna Carta after a long civil war is really unbelievably distant and almost forgotten. How could it have anything to do with us today, with us moderns? And that's what I really find amazing. And I think its durability and resonance have to do with our, our wariness, our skepticism about concentrated power, especially of the sovereign. We like to remind ourselves that the, the authority is restrained by the rule of law and that this represents a new and civilizing moment in human history. And we love to identify with the underdog and declare that even kings uh, must respect something transcendent and universal called law, which is said to protect individual rights and liberties. And it was in this spirit that the American Bar Association uh, erected that image, uh, that monument we saw on the screen a moment ago in 1957. And it, it bore the inscription, Freedom Under Law. And on grand public occasions, especially this year, we see judges and politicians and law scholars and distinguished gray eminences get up and declare how constitutional government and representative democracy are continuing to uphold the principles of Magna Carta. And I'll have more to say about that in a moment. But this evening, I'd like to explore a, a richer, more complex story about Magna Carta and its meanings for us today. Because in fact, there are two distinct but related stories to be told. Story number one, uh, we might call the triumph of the market state. And that's the story I basically just told, which is usually invoked by the distinguished elites of our society to celebrate constitutional democracy and its close alliance with so-called free markets and the idea of freedom under law. Uh, all of which are, of course, significant achievements in many respects, but I also want to tell story number two. Story number one assures us that constitutional government and representative democracy actually serve as the brave bulwarks of liberty and law of Magna Carta. And to be sure, th this is a great advance over monarchy, tribalism, and the Hobbesian war of, of uh, each against all that prevailed in many regions of the world then and, and afterwards. But I'm interested in uh, a story that, that doesn't get told very often. I call it story number two, or law for the commons. And it, it doesn't have the high-minded flourishes or the, the, the sanctimony that is often associated with uh, the official mainstream story. It's a more down-to-earth and uh, a story that's focused more on ordinary people, the commoners. And this second story uh, is less about the signing of the Magna Carta than about the ongoing struggle, uh, the unfinished struggle, to make those principles real in, everybody, in people's lives. And so it's about the story number two is about the functional legal significance of Magna Carta in me meeting people's everyday survival needs and in fulfilling human rights. It's about assuring that everyone can access the common wealth that uh, we all inherit 
together. Uh, or put more plainly, you might say story number two is about who may use the king's forests. Now, the answer to that uh, among commoners in the, in the uh, early 1200s was, what do you mean the king's forest? They belong to us, or they've been ours for centuries. And of course, they were reacting to the, to the king's uh, enclosures of, and taking over uh, of many of those forests that had traditionally been theirs. So the forgotten legacy of the Magna Carta is really the frank acknowledgement that commoners have rights too. The right of the commoners to use the forest, the right to self-organize their own rules for, for accessing and protecting those resources, and the civil rights and liberties uh, to protect themselves from the sovereign's arbitra arbitrary abuses of power. Now all of these preceded the very idea of written law and Magna Carta. They were considered human rights based on fundamental needs and long-standing traditions. And we have to remember that in the 13th century, commoners relied upon the forest for nearly everything. They used the forest to cook their, to, uh, to find food to cook and to, and to heat their houses. They, they caught wild game and fish from the forests. They used air, acorns and plants for their pigs, which was quite important. And so in, in a sense, the forest was an entire universe a place that may have been owned by feudal lords, but nonetheless a place that commoners were entitled by long-standing custom to use for their uh, everyday needs. And so it was a place that really inframed their culture, their imaginations, and their very identity. So when King John started arrogating to himself greater and greater control of forest lands, it produced a, a really a serious squeeze, not just on the feudal nobility, who of course objected and fought back, but also on the commoners whose daily survival was now jeopardized. The, the royal encroachments of the forest, which were ruthlessly enforced by the king's sheriffs, meant that livestock couldn't roam the forest anymore. Pigs couldn't eat acorns and grow fat. Commoners could not gather timber to fix their homes. Fu fruit and fish could not be taken and eaten. Boats couldn't navigate on, on rivers upon which dams or private uh, causeways had been built. So all of this, and much else, of course, prolonged uh, the bitter civil war in England before it was ultimately resolved through the Magna Carta. It was a political struggle. And the terms of peace were a series of legal limitations in writing on the king's absolute power and a series of stipulated legal rights for people including commoners. Now what's usually forgotten in this story of the Magna Carta is the companion document that was officially incorporated two years later called the Charter of the Forest. And this document explicitly protected the uh, customary rights of commoners. Uh, it's really kind of a, a human rights convention that guaranteed commoners the specific, specific rights such as the rights of panage, which was the right to, for pasture for their pigs, or the right of estover, which is the right to collect firewood, or the right of uh, adjustment, which is to graze cattle, or the right of turbury, which is to cut turf for fuel, and so on. All of these, of course, rooted in medieval everyday life. But it was, uh, in a sense, a story that isn't really told these days, but the, Magna the Charter of the Forest was the first legal limitation on privati privatization of the commons. And that's a story we really don't hear in these uh, official recognitions, uh, celebrations of the Magna Carta, but it's really uh, one of the great achievements of Magna Carta because it granted commoners a formal right of access to the collective resources fundamental to human survival. And so it protected them against acts of what we would now call acts of state terror uh, by pro pro prohibiting the king's sheriff from abuse of arrests and mayhem and torture in the course of defending the king's arbitrary enclosures. Now, unfortunately, Magna Carta did not come equipped with the means to self-enforce its principles. The sovereign could suspend uh, the transcendent law at will, restrained only by the social or political outcry that might result. And this is exactly what has happened in the centuries since Magna Carta was signed. In 1536, 
King Henry VIII uh, eliminated Catholic monasteries in England, which was, as Peter Leinbau, the historian, calls it, a massive act of state-sponsored privatization. He, he, he writes, quote, this opened the door for a new class, the gentry, to take the land and turn it to profit by means of enclosures. So the dissolution of monasteries was a, was a massive uh, act of state-sponsored privatization that converted the English landmass into a commodity. It was like the disenchantment of the land, according to one journalist at the time. And then in the 17th and 18th centuries, Parliament authorized some 4,000 acts of enclosure on behalf of the ruling or the rising class of gentry. And this allowed them to uh, appropriate about 15% of all land, uh, common lands in England for their private use. Now, these enclosures destroyed uh, many commoners' deep connections to the soil and just really destroyed their cultures and traditions, paving the way for industrialization. And so, in the process, a new class of people were created, proletariats, consumers, paupers. Uh, people who had once been commoners were dispossessed of their commons, uh, and they had no choice but to try to find a place for themselves in the new capitalist order. So what became of the Magna Carta in this new world? The, the supremacy of the written law was supposed to be a great advance in giving law greater durability and respect. But I think we overrate the power of written law. Yes, the law was written and formal, and it helped made rules of governance seem more permanent and even timeless. And certainly the champions of the Magna Carta, including the king, have tried to promote this idea about law. Yet in truth, when law becomes disconnected from the social community that's governed by it, when, we, when active consent can be overridden by interpretations by professional lawyers or politicians or judges, it's really the first step to a new kind of tyranny because written law opens the door to this problem because legality and legitimacy get separated. They're not the same, but they get separated. And so by making law an artifact of the printed word, something that professional lawyers and uh, jurists and outsiders could uh, present as objective and universal set of ru rules, written law in a strange way began to create a new realm of governance called legality. And it became an object of external interpretation and manipulation and even corruption, uh, something that was divorced from the people themselves and their social practices. It, law became an icon to be invoked as absolute and independent, requiring strict obedience. Yet, at the very same time, law uh, as a written code uh, you know, became something that the king started to see the virtues of because he could claim the mantle of le legality so, so long as it had some plausible relationship to uh, formal written documents. And who cares about legitimacy? That no longer was as important. It didn't have to be earned necessarily, at least under the monarchy. And even one could say today, the legitimacy that uh, the, today's sovereigns have is not as earned as it ought to be. And it also is worth remember, remembering that the sovereign conveniently retains a monopoly on coercive power to enforce the law as he sees it. Um, so this helps explain why the principles of Magna Carta have been really an unreliable guarantor of human rights. I mean, I've already mentioned the king's enclosure of Catholic monasteries in England and the enclosure movements of the 17th and 18th centuries. But in our own time, we've seen that constitutional democracy is not the fearless defender of due process, fairness, human rights, and commoning, especially since 9-11. I mean, the sovereigns of our time, the nation state in alliance with transnational corporations, have found plenty of ways to evade the supposed constraints of constitutional democracy and judicial review. 
We've seen how the self-declared national security state uh, and the interests, at least of the US government, have trumped the rights of habeas corpus. And notwithstanding Magna Carta, the US military and CIA have inflicted torture on countless individuals and uh, have uh, had many thousands of military drone strikes that really amount to lawless extrajudicial assassinations. So one could go on, but the point is that the established institutions of constitutional government and democracy have often stood silently by, showing little interest in identifying and punishing flagrant abuses of Magna Carta principles. So there's kind of a dissonance going on uh, in our contemporary uh, political lives because the sovereigns, the nation state and, and um, the, the market state, as I like to call it, they, they love to celebrate Magna Carta uh, as if administering in a benign way over our modern order. And that's more or less what happened of, uh, earlier this year in Westminster, uh, England, when many political VIPs and uh, top business executives from places like Goldman Sachs and uh, Barrett Gold Corporation came out to celebrate the rule of law. And you could say that our fascination with Magna Carta over the centuries is in some ways aspirational, or if you wish to be more skeptical or even cynical, a useful cover story. We like to re reassure ourselves or convince ourselves that power is indeed domesticated and uh, is serving humanity in good faith. Uh, this may be true, it often is not as well. So in truth, the neoliberal order as assisted by the state has proven to be uh, as zealous and ruthless as uh, King John was in enclosing the commons. States and the corporate sector now uh, routinely collude in using law and legality to privatize our common wealth. You can see this in the, uh, in the global fi finance sector, which has done so much to enclose uh, our shared wealth. We see it in the Earth's atmosphere, which is used as a free waste dump by major industries, how biotech and pharmaceutical companies are allowed to convert life forms from genes and bacteria and even sheep into private commodities via uh, patent law. Investors and sovereign um, investment funds are buying up huge swaths of land across Africa and Asia and Latin America in this massive global land grab now going on, which is dispossessing commoners by the millions and setting the stage for future famines. Companies are plundering oceans of fish, minerals, Latin America is now uh, being victimized by massive neo-extractivist policies and projects. Everything from words and smells and colors can now be trademarked and even two second snippets of music can be copyrighted. So in King John's time, enclosure was mostly about the forest. And today it's really about really everything including life itself. So to return to the question I posed earlier, who may use the king's forest. I think law today has become in many instances so captured or even corrupted by the contemporary sovereign, notwithstanding constitutions, elections, and courts, that there is little room for commoners to govern themselves or vindicate their rights in the face of the sovereign because the sovereign market state insists upon controlling nearly everything by the logic of market exchange. So this leaves very little space legally, culturally, economically for commoners to use their own common wealth or to devise their own rules for managing things. Uh, political and corporate elites and their affiliated retainers administer a system of, of formalized legality that presumes a, a moral and social legitimacy that is fast disappearing. And I think that this is because legality is so often used to trump what I call vernacular law, which are the, the norms and values of the street or the moral and political authority of ordinary people. The, the law of the commons once declared by Magna Carta has become primarily an, instru an instrument of market state power and not an expression of the pre-political sovereignty of human beings. 
because it's, it's the, the market state has arrogated to itself uh, the human rights that really precede the state. And these rights, of course, belong to commoners. Um, in the United States, as you know, many, many cor or corporations have been legally recognized as persons with all the civil rights and freedoms that real people are supposed to have. And yet, in a reversal, commoners and the earth itself are treated as brute, unfeeling commodities without dignity or rights of their own. So I think that these are some of the challenges we need to address in talking about uh, Magna Carta these days. But you might say, why, despite these many shortcomings, do I celebrate the Magna Carta? I think it's because the Charter of the Forest, as incorporated into Magna Carta, has recognized the legitimacy of commoning. It's decriminalized it, and it made it legal for the first time in history. And this is important, I think, in itself. Finally, as a matter of law, people were granted a significant measure of formal legal freedom to govern themselves, to devise rules that seemed fair, legitimate, and effective for their circumstances. In other words, thanks to commoning and its formal recognition by the Charter of the Forest, the sovereign could not assert absolute legal authority. The people, the commoners, retained significant moral rights, human rights, and economic rights. And these timeless customary rights uh, were guaranteed, quote, in a new type of formal written law, and the king recognized this fact. This was, of course, a significant advance uh, in human governance. But here's the challenge I think that the, the Magna Carta leaves us with, um, how to reintegrate legality with legitimacy. How do we get the sovereigns of our time, the market state, to recognize the rights of commoners? I think the, I the answer lies in reintegrating uh, the idea of written law with vernacular law or commons-based law, uh, the law of living communities of commoners. If we want to take the, the Magna Carta seriously, we need to reinvent some of the legal structures by which we try to fulfill the Magna Carta's principles in the modern age. I submit that what we really need to do is reinvent law for the commons. We need to draw upon the traditions of Magna Carta and state law, but deliberately carve out spaces for people to craft, craft their own rules, rules that seem fair and appropriate to them while, while being subject to some of the larger principles and human rights of the existing polity today. In other words, people must be allowed to engage in commoning. They must be able to play significant roles in managing their forests themselves, and in so doing, become stewards of those forests. They have to be able to draw upon their own insights and imagination and uh, on their customary social practices. They have to be able to develop a sense of shared community and develop their own rituals and traditions in managing things and step up to some responsibility in that. One way of putting this I like to think of is that law has to honor people's affective labor, uh, as geographer Neera Singh puts it, meaning the subjective feelings and emotions and pride and pleasure that comes with managing one's own commons. Now, this, of course, will require that we move away from uh, the worldview of standard economics, which has the idea that we are all just isolated individuals who are disconnected from each other without a history, without a culture, who are really just rational materialists. Of course, the commons proposes a different ideal of what human beings are. But th the beauty of, I think, a law of the commons is that it goes beyond formal legalisms. Uh, Peter, uh, Peter Leinbau, the historian again, uh, it stresses that the commons-based law, uh, or the commoners, are grappling with their own evolving local circumstances, and that it's an imminent practical reality, not a fixed and eternal transcendent ideal, uh, which is somehow off there. As, as Leinbau writes, commoners think not of title deeds, but of human deeds. How will this land be, be tilled? Does it require manuring? What grows there? 
They begin to explore. You might call it a natural attitude. Commoning is embedded in a labor process. It inheres in the particular praxis of field, upland, forest, marsh, coast. Common rights are entered into by labor. So in other words, law is in integrated with everyday life and practice quite intimately. It's not abstract and out there somewhere. So this is a very different ontological understanding of law itself. Law doesn't start with these abstractions and written documents. It starts with the gritty, particular realities as they're experienced by commoners. And it emerges from those experiences uh, as people devise their own appropriate systems of self-governance. So in making the jump to formal written law, Magna Carta may have enshrined certain principles into the memory of civilization, which is quite, um, quite no small achievement. I think that's quite significant. But that leap came at a cost, which was the gradual loss of the memory and practice of commoning, which I think is quite important to the legitimacy of law. So it's revealing that in the years after the Magna Carta, the king often had to reassure, reassure skeptical commoners and barons that he would in fact uphold his end of the bargain. So every number of years, he would grandly, uh, with a grand flourish, uh, reissue, reprint the Magna Carta to show that it was still the, the, uh, the law of the land. But the real challenge in our time is to devise some new legal regimes that recognize and protect the commoning. The commoning. Uh, law must be crafted to help support these spaces um, let, me, let me close by saying that you know, some people think that the commons is some arcane, archaic, medieval tradition. But in fact, it's really quite alive and around us right now. And to help sort of drive this point, uh, Silke and, and I recently finished, finished a book which will be coming out in October called Patterns of Commoning which profiles uh, several dozen contemporary successful commons in all parts of the world with many resource domains. And the idea was to show that uh, today's uh, indigenous uh, agriculture systems, the high-tech fab labs, the alternative currencies around the world, the commons of open space farm equipment, uh, open source farm equipment such as fab lab, a lot of collaborative mapping projects and much else are really our contemporary examples of commoning. Um, in short, human beings are not just homo economicus, they are commoners. So this, this working on this sort of led me to the question, well, what would it look like if commoners could invent their own types of law consistent with state law to reliably protect their commons? What if there was a more rigorous law for the commons. So I, I realized, of course, that there was the history of Magna Carta, but could we commoners invent some new for, forms of commons-based law today? And so those of you who are familiar with the digital world may be familiar with creative commons law, uh, licenses or general public license as examples of this. Those are master strokes of legal ingenuity that I think we need to build upon and replicate in all sorts of different areas. And uh, we can start to talk about some of those examples. Michelle will be talking in a minute about those. I'm pleased to say that you can look at some of these examples on a wiki uh, that we uh, published on the Commons Transition website, which Michelle uh, Bowens and his colleague Stacco Troncoso maintain, which uh, itemizes several dozen contemporary uh, efforts of devising law for the Commons. And I, I find it very inspirational that there's this uh, template that we can build upon. So in closing, let me just say, the magna these principles can only be actualized through a political struggle. It's not just an imaginative legal effort. Uh, and, and we need to, the very idea that, um, well, I have, I have no illusion that we can simply declare this. We have to struggle for it. But it, uh, at a time when uh, existing regimes of law and governance are in their shambles, starting to lose respect, not uh, delivering pe people's needs, destroying the earth, I think commoning and laws, uh, really uh, commoning and law have a bright future because they're starting to point towards ways 
that are fair, open, and effective, and can provide a measure of uh, dignity, respect, and equality that we often find the market state regimes have trouble achieving. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Michelle to elaborate on how some of this is occurring in the digital realm, the world of open source software, open design and manufacturing, hacker spaces, and so forth. Uh, this is the world of commons-based peer production where code itself and social practice are becoming a new type of law. So, Michelle, I'd like for you to sort of continue on in some of this arc. Thank you. Thank you, David.